for our meeting today. If you are dialing in via telephone, Google Hangout has muted you. If you need to speak to the group, please rest star six on your phone to unmute and mute. If you're using your laptop for audio and visual during the meeting, you can control the mute function on the Hangout. We kindly ask that only those who are speaking to the group unmute their device. Do you are a board member? Please reserve the question until the end of the presentation or may ask in the Google Hangout meeting chat. For public comment, if you would like to provide a public comment, a conflict of interest must be on file. We send an email to medicaidpharmacy at utah.gov. For attendees that are not on, not the member of the DUR board, please enter your contact information in the Google Sheet chat or email medicaidpharmacy at utah.gov. Please use the chat on the right if needed. Please provide normative feedback after meeting to help us improve our process moving forward. Thank you. And I want to leave this to Dr. Catherine Smith. Hello. Good morning. Is everybody able to hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, and I see or heard that we do have a quorum. And um, we had uh, some housekeeping that was already provided. So next would be review and approval of minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve. Thank you. I'll second that. Thank you so much. All right. Um, all in favor of approval of the minutes as written, say aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks. The minutes stand approved. All right. Next item on the agenda is the PNT committee update from Brian Larson. Good morning. So we Good met morning. in May as a PNT committee on the 20th, and we had our um, annual updates from the accountable care organizations uh, on their methodologies for their PDLs. And we also discussed glucagon products, including analogs. And uh, we anticipate um, adding this class of drugs to the PDL in July and um, look forward to having that new addition to the PDL. That's everything I have. All right, sounds good. Thank you. And next item on the agenda is the opio opioid naive policy update. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do, and the team has prepared a policy proposal, um, which we would like to review with you for our next steps to implement um, opioid policy. As a background, um, and as I'm pulling up this document, we're all aware that the Support Act, which was uh, released, I believe, in 2018, um, required that Medicaid programs and the accountable care organizations or Medicaid implement um, numerous opioid edits, both prospective and retrospective edits to enhance the oversight and monitoring of opioid use among Medicaid members. And that's the second bullet we have here. And as you know, we uh, at that time uh, implemented a uniform MME uh, while we started uh, Opioid Experience and Opioid Naive MME, we uh, had the Opioid Experienced MME at 180 to begin. And then every six months, we would bring that Opioid Experienced population down. And at this point today, we have a uniform um, MME of 90 MMEs per day. Um, however, we do recognize that um, Opioid Naive individuals and those who have been opioid experienced do have different outcomes um, and different tolerance when exposed to an opioid. And, and of course, this is demonstrated in numerous studies and um, also supported by CDC guidance. Today, Utah Medicaid defines a patient as opioid naive if there has not been an opioid field in the last 60 days. So 
if a claim for an opioid um, hits the pharmacy system, uh, the system will look back 60 days and it will look uh, to see if there was an opioid, if there was not an, a claim for an opioid, it will tag the member as opioid naive. Um, and regardless now, it's, it's a uniform 90 MME limit. But to understand, we recognize that a 60 day look back is probably too much. But at the time when we did this, um, this was what our system programming was. And it is something we're looking at in the future. But for the purpose of what we're proposing today in this um, draft policy is uh, that we actually bring that opioid naive limit down and reduce it. So what we know is that higher doses, especially in opioid naive individuals, um, tend increase the risk of overdose uh, substantially. And there is evidence to show of, of course, increasing risk of harm for a 20 MME dose versus a 50 MME. And then of course, as we move up to 100 MMEs, it increases the risk of overdose or respiratory depression and harm ninefold. And of course, there are uh, references at the end that demonstrate the studies that have, um, that have shown this. As such, the CDC recommends clinicians carefully assess evidence of benefit versus risk when considering increasing the dose above 50 MMEs per day. Um, CMS has also issued some, um, I think, advisory language, although it is not a firm statement to move forward with an opioid naive limit of 50 MMEs at this time. It is certainly something that is being discussed uh, from CMS to Medicaid programs. In 2019, when you review DUR submissions on their reports, there were nine state or seven states that had reported uh, an opioid naive limit of 50 MMEs per day. And Utah would like to propose moving in this direction as well. The proposal would be that we implement point of sale edits and require pri prior authorization for opioid naive prescriptions um, as aligned with evidence based CDC standards. We would like to do a stepwise approach and propose that we introduce this first in July uh, with soft messaging to pharmacies. So when a claim for either a three day or a seven day prescription runs through the point of sale system and whether it's considered, um, usually it tags as a three day or seven day, uh, it hits this opioid naive edit, which limits it to a three day or a seven day prescription. So. When this were to happen, um, a message would flash that would say, um, effective January 1st, 2022, opioid naive members will be limited to 50 MME per CDC guidelines. Um, now we are text limited and pharmacies only display a certain number of characters, which is why we propose this language. It gives um, the pharmacy, um, uh, of course, the opportunity to just push through it as a soft message but an alert that there will be changes coming January 1st, but also an educational prompt that 50 MMEs is that limit. A quarter, like for the quarter preceding January 1st, 2022, uh, we would like to provide education uh, to our pharmacy stakeholders, our prescribers, and then do focused prescriber outreach to our top 10% of Medicaid providers who have prescribed claims that exceed 50 MMEs in the prior three months. And this would be um, both broad education as well as focused education. So they're aware of some updates in policy and the rationale for that. Effective January 1st, 2022, we would then go live with a hard edit so that when a claim for an opioid naive um, short acting prescription were to process through the pharmacy point of sale uh, for more than 50 MMEs per day, it would actually reject. And an exception to this would require prior authorization. Now we understand that um, sometimes members come to fee-for-service Medicaid and they have been maintained on opioids in this case, if a pharmacy, uh, but it, they look new to our system is the point. In this uh, instance, if a pharmacy were to call a provider 
um, or the staff were to look at, get a call and uh, look at the controlled substance database to verify that there would be the opportunity for an override. So the claim could process without prior authorization. Um, I think before we uh, move on to utilization impact, the one piece that I think is important to understand is what is 50 MMEs, okay? How, how much drug is that? And so very common first prescription um, that a person might get for pain management is hydrocodone five milligrams with acetaminophen. So uh, otherwise Lortab five milligrams. And what that quantity is for that would be 50 MMEs per day equals 50 milligrams of hydrocodone. That would be 10 tablets per day. So what's happening today is, and having worked in, and you guys have worked in pharmacy or you've prescribed medicines, uh, pain, short-acting uh, opioids, when you have one to two tablets every four to six hours, when the pharmacy computer computes that, it will go to the most frequent uh, presentation of that. That would mean two tablets every four hours equals 12 tablets per day of five milligrams of hydrocodone. That exceeds 50 MMEs per day. We'd have to back that off so that the person could get, you know, the, the prescription and the, the, the system would permit up to 10 tablets for that person to take per day. But if it were to maximize some prescribing that happens today, it would it would block it at, at 12 tablets. Now, I think we all recognize the rationale behind this is safety. Number one, safety. Um, if you or I were opioid naive and were to take 10 milligrams of hydrocodone every four hours, we'd be probably be suckered, right? If we were new to that. So recognize that there is um, a safety element to this. And that is, of course, the reason why this policy is being proposed. Additionally, there is uh, abundant evidence to show that individuals who have excess dose or excess quantity are more likely to have continued use over time. So um, again, when we look at um, managing the opioid epidemic and actually protecting folks who need pain control and have um, a uh, medically necessary reason to have opioids, um, this allows you know, 10 tablets of hydrocodone, for example, uh, five milligrams to be filled to receive adequate pain, pain control, but at the same time to put safety um, limits in place. So we did want to, of course, whenever we evaluate and develop policy, we always want to look at impact. What is this going to do to our members? What is this going to do to the population? Um, and of course, uh, when you look at utilization data for calendar year 2020, we evaluated all three-day claims and seven-day opioid claims that hit the system, both for fee-for-service and the accountable care organizations. What we found for the three-day dental claims or those that adjudicated at a three-day supply, there were 70 uh, fee-for-service claims over one year that exceeded 50 MMEs um, and 541 seven-day supply opioid naive claims that were more than 50 MMEs. So we're looking at 2.8% of fee-for-service claims and 10% of fee-for-service claims that were hitting this greater than 50 MME edit. On the accountable care side, as you know, we have a much larger patient population um, on the accountable care side. Uh, there were 8.1% of total three-day supplies or 752 claims that exceeded this limit and 21.8% or 2,000 um, and change of seven-day supply that did and that would have hit, that hit this, um, that exceeded this limit. So there would be definitely um, an impact, which we then, um, is the rationale for uh, uh, um, approaching this with a stepwise approach. Um, also, uh, I did present this proposal to the accountable care organizations yesterday in our monthly meeting, um, and we'll meet um, individually with the pharmacy directors as well. They've seen a little bit of this draft initial language, but now moving into more of the specifics and the proposal 
we'll do that in the next couple of weeks to be able to walk through this and talk about impact. But the goal is actually to go live with these edits with the service and the accountable care organizations at the same time. So there is uniformity across all of Medicaid and that was the intent. And so we're sensitive to implementation timeframes, impact on prescribers, impact on members. Um, we felt that a six month window um, allowing soft messaging, education um, before go live would be a reasonable amount of time um, to apply this uh, across the Medicaid population. But we still have to dive into uh, more detailed conversations with the ACOs. So there may be some flex on this depending on what their system programming and what their um, feelings are about this. Um, deliverables, we always kind of put forth to our leadership when we propose this. Um, how are we going to do this? Uh, bringing this to DUR board was an essential piece of this. We'd love to get your feedback on this proposed policy um, and um, you know, have you bring any of your thoughts or uh, concerns to us, recommendations. Um, we will take it through our internal policy committee, which allows internal stakeholders to have exposure to this. Our public health partners as well, um, ACO partners, we began that conversation yesterday. Um, and earlier this year, we did it. This is part of our strategic plan. So we did introduce it as part of our annual strategic plan goals to the ACOs. Uh, we also know that it's going to require some programming on behalf of our point of sale vendor. So uh, we did um, put that in place. It would not have an impact on administrative rule. Uh, today, our uh, language. Um, that describes our opioid limitations is pretty generic and allows for flexibility for um, policy change over time. Um, but the, it does have limitations such as initial fill limits and MME limits and quantity limits. These are all broadly addressed in rule and wouldn't require any rule update. Then, of course, I mentioned uh, stakeholder and provider education. There is some draft. Um, uh, it, Facts, blast language, MIB language, um, and some um, manual language here as well. Anyway, with that, um, we'd love to have some discussion on this with the board um, and take your, your initial thoughts, feedback, comments, um, considerations. I had a question, Jennifer. Yep. Um, since I guess like there's the potential to, um, for the pharmacies to need to be kind of the interceptor between, uh, the patient and the prescriber, if say the 60 day look back is not accurate for like, maybe they've, they're new to the system or something like that. Um, any, any, did you get any information from the pharmacies about, how how they felt that process would work? Um, not yet. Okay. We haven't engaged the pharmacies with this yet. Um, this is, of course, it's just draft policy. So we're really just um, introducing it to our, we're just bringing it outside of our internal work groups, actually, gotcha. at this point. But I think it's really important because these are not overridable claims. They would need okay. to, call pharmacy, uh, to call us to get an override placed on them. Um, uh, okay. So yeah, it's not something that at the point of sale, the pharmacy itself could override. Um, but uh, they could call us again, you know, we work business hours. So there is that opportunity for outside of business hours. That's where our educational efforts, um, you know, would really have to be robust throughout the period of time leading up to this policy change. And Catherine, this is Eric. I mean, I can I can comment on the experience we've had with pharmacies. I you know, as Select Health has implemented these kinds of edits, my phone has just rung off the hook. And even <laughs> had a had a neighbor that's an ENT walk over and say, What the heck are you doing? And as soon as they realized, oh my gosh, you, you know, this isn't as a as aggressive or crazy as I maybe I had thought, um, we get virtually no phone calls right now in terms of pharmacies needing to override things. The pharmacies are very accustomed to it, 
So, you know, for the most part, they will call. Um, I, I do worry from time to time that there are some chain pharmacies that just hand the prescription back to the patient and say, sorry, I can't help you. But, you know, for the most part, I think the community is really good. They do call. But my experience has been most physicians have adapted and they're not writing some of the big quantities they once were, at least for that initial kind of three to seven day period of time. Yeah, I think we're, we're talking about the treatment of pain. We're talking about the treatment of acute pain here, right? So you have, you have dental, which you're saying is three days, and then I'm assuming the rest is mostly procedural or surgical pain. And there's been an enormous amount of education in, um, in the surgical field. There's, there's, you know, there's a number of papers and there's been a lot of, um, a lot of education to, uh, to the surgery community about, uh, the treatment of post-surgical pain and emphasizing, um, non-opioid post-surgical pain treatment, pain prevention preoperatively. And so that, you know, we've had a lot of advances in the management of perioperative pain control. I'm not sure how much you know, there is for, for dentistry the same way for, you know, preventive, because <laughs> I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the severe dental pain might come on, you know, it's, it's, it's unanticipated, a dental abscess is unanticipated maybe, but um, for some of the things, there's probably um, uh, education in, in, in the dental field the same way. So I think, I think a lot of, uh, I mean, I don't know if you have the data to, 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 to back this up, but, but I think a lot of this, um, excessive prescribing had been coming down, you know, over the last couple of years anyway. So I, I, I do, I do appreciate the, you know, the, the, the process to, you know, you get, get these, get these things in place to, to limit quantities. My, my concern only is, you know, if, if a patient, again, these are, you know, average, so we're going to say dental pain is three days and surgical pain is seven days, but you know, patients, patients vary. And if a clinician, um, does have a need to extend a patient's treatment, then, then we, we want that to be facilitated. I mean, the clinicians won't, if there are barriers, patients won't get treatment. And, and we know that what happens then is they, they, they drive to other, <laughs> they drive to other sources. And that's where all this accumulation of pills in the home has led to adverse outcomes. And so, what I think we don't, we don't always follow through what happens when we put limits in is that, is that people in pain, um, look, look for ways to treat it and where they've had, where they've had successful treatment with opioids, they're going to look for that. And that isn't necessarily substance abuse and drug abuse in the addiction. It's, it's the seeking of pain treatment. So as long as we have some, some ways for clinicians to then reevaluate the patient, you know, extend a short-term prescription and, and the, and the built-in edits don't stop people, you know, hard in their tracks. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that we're, 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 we've got, we've got, you've got your processes in place on, on your end that, that, that will work so that people can get fairly prompt. I don't mean after hours. I don't ever think pain treatment should be done after hours unless it's truly an emergency, right? Um, but that you have your processes in place so that people can have communication and say yes for this patient. And, you know, it's, it's whatever it needs to be. Um, that would be, that would be my, uh, I guess those are my thoughts on this um, process wise. Thank you. All right, great discussion. So do we need to make a motion to approve this, I assume? Yeah, we, we talked about that um, amongst our team and we're like, well, we it's a policy proposal at this point. We still have other stakeholders to vet this with, but I do think um, as far as it's, a, it's proposed, if the concept is as, you know, where it's at today as a draft, um, I think it would be nice to get some feet, you know, a, I guess a motion from the board on the concept. We will bring this back to you after we've had a chance to 
um, vet it with the pharmacy directors. They wanted some time to really look at um, impact in the system and what it would take and, you know, evaluate their steps too. So um, you could certainly, I, I, we would invite just a proposal to move forward with the uh, draft um, steps that we have if, if you would please. Gotcha. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right. Sounds like the proposal um, will be moving forward. So thank you. And thanks for good discussion on that. Um, so our next item on the agenda is antidepressant medication management program. Um, just wanted to uh, let you know, I need to leave in about five minutes. Is somebody, can someone take over for me? Yes, that's that point? Yep. Okay, great. I All right, thank you. Okay, so thanks. Uh, thank you for um, giving us your feedback and thoughts on our opioid naive proposal. Uh, what we wanted to do now was to give you an intervention update on um, a retrospective DUR effort we put forth earlier this year, just a few months ago, we kicked it off. Um, and we wanted to give you an update on the work we're doing in this area. I'm going to present just the background slides, which I believe you've seen these before, um, but just set the table for you. So um, you're prepared to look at what the intervention steps are. And then I'm going to transition over to Luis who is the pharmacist on our team who is doing this work uh, for him to go through his experience in calling individuals and working with them to address adherence for uh, antidepressants. So I'm gonna move pretty quickly through these background slides. Um, first of all, we know our rates of depression are um, higher than the national average in Utah. Um, the data here says 23% in Utah, 19.1% nationally. We know that uh, medications as well as um, cognitive behavioral therapy are cornerstones of treatment for depression, but that each person is kind of unique in how they respond. Um, and that also when we talk specifically about medicines, which is what we're doing today, we know that um, there are a host of factors that influence a patient's response to medications. And uh, of course, which is why I think this uh, measure was developed um, to look and address early treatment of depression with um, medication medications. So um, we also know uh, that when we have patients who have depression and other comorbidities, such as we specifically looked at diabetes and chronic pain, we know that the literature shows that patients with depression and diabetes and those with chronic pain actually do worse if the depression is not managed. So they have higher rates of morbidity, mortality, uh, they die sooner, and also healthcare costs are much, much higher. With this, we also know that the medications are troublesome. There's lots of side effects, they take a long time to work. Um, maybe patients don't understand what they're being used for, what symptoms they're treating, and that they don't work just like that. There's this barrier of health literacy among the Medicaid population and others. Um, and as such, non-adherence is quite high among antidepressants. And we, if, if a patient stays on their antidepressant, we know that oftentimes even the first medicine may not be the one they stick with. About 30% of patients respond to the first medicine and, and others have to, have to try different therapies. So that's frustrating and, and challenging for an individual who's dealing with depression. Um, and so our intervention goal, and again, this is one of our strategic goals this year, is to increase medication adherence to antidepressant therapy for specifically fee-for-service members who are newly diagnosed with depression. And the way we initially framed this was with concurrent diabetes. So we are also looking at the chronic pain population, and we also have all comers. But we wanted to really narrow in and look at our baseline rates of adherence for those with diabetes and depression. So we wanted to increase it from 54% to 57% in the acute phase and from 33 to 35% in the continuation phase by December 31st, 2021. 
Um, this may seem like a conservative reach, but it's a new intervention. Our rates nationally for adherence are actually not far behind national standards. They're actually kind of hitting the mark. Um, but this is a complex com uh, co uh, population. Um, and uh, being a new intervention, we uh, these are the, the um, improvements that we identified. Our first step in this is using a standardized uh, NCQA HEDIS measure, a, uh, the AMM, antidepressant medication management measure, as the basis to identify members with newly diagnosed depression. And of course, with this, we our goal is to target the acute phase population and also the continuation phase population within the defined parameters. And Luis will get a little more into the detail of that. We next wanted to, once we identified the whole population, um, in this group, we wanted to develop some subgroups that we could identify and focus on. So we wanted to stratify them based off of our higher risk groups. Um, and depending on the volume of individuals identified, focus specifically on chronic pain and diabetes. Um, and then we wanted to develop an outreach program and adherence coaching by a pharmacist to this targeted population. Um, and Luis, again, will go into the details of that. So this is stuff you guys should have seen before. Um, I'm going to transition over here, Luis, if you want to take it away from here. Well, great. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jen. <clears throat> so yes, um, I want to tell you about this exciting opportunity uh, to work with specifically uh, Medicaid fee-for-service members uh, with depression. And so <clears throat> I started calling these members around the 17th of March. and um, and so far, I've been able to reach a few of them, um, and I will go into you know the challenges uh, with reaching out to these members in a future slide. But so yeah, I just wanted to make it um, uh, clear that we're reaching out. I'm reaching out only to adult members um, with depression in the acute phase, uh, which is defined as um, they have received or have been prescribed an antidepressant. Um, in the past 12, 12 weeks um, from diagnosis and uh, and also the continuation phase, which is 100, um, 180 days you know, after they were prescribed an antidepressant. Um, the member contact lists are, gener are generated once a week, so they're updated weekly. And next slide, please. And so what I do is I call a member targeted for this intervention, and I try to talk to them, introduce myself, let them know that I'm on their side, um, you know, ask them questions, specific questions, you know, what you're taking this medication for, um, did the doctor explain how long you would be taking it, um, are there any, um, what, what side effects do you have from this medication? Um, and you know, did the doctor explain uh, when this medication might start working? Um, and uh, when you go to the pharmacy, you know, um, do you have a car to get to the pharmacy? Are you having any trouble refilling your prescriptions at the pharmacy? Um, so very um, key questions like that, so I can get a little more, uh, a clearer picture of how come the patient hasn't refilled their prescription in the last month or so. Um, and so with that, you know, I try to tailor um, recommendations for the patient according to what they say. Um, some have just gotten out of a rehab uh, center. Um, and so they weren't sure that the prescription actually had any refills remaining. And so um, they hadn't called the pharmacy to, they just ran out of medication and they figured, okay, uh, I guess it was just for 30 days, and so I guess I'm okay now. Um, and so some also um, don't have good transportation or reliable transportation. And so then I will offer to um, see if we can find a pharmacy that delivers to their home. Um, so small, simple things like that to make the, uh, the process a lot easier for the member to get their prescriptions. Um, and then after that initial call, I uh, compose a letter to kind of remind the member, you know, please um, 
Uh, remember to refill your prescription maybe five days before you run out. Call your pharmacy. Um, please follow up with your doctor. Um, uh, key points like that so they can remember. I give them my phone number so they can reach out to me if they have any questions in the future. And I also try to establish a follow-up. You know, um, Some want me to follow up a week later. Some want me to follow up a month later. Uh, so I kind of try to tailor that according to their needs. Um, and then also I document the call in the, we have, we have a pharmacy call tracking database so that in the case that I'm, you know, in the event that I'm not in office or not working on vacation, another pharmacist can just look into that database and see um, what kind of conversations I've been having with the patient. Uh, in the event where I call a member and uh, I can get a hold of them, then I will try for two more times before I sort of move on to the next member. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's kind of the process that, that we have in place so far uh, for this AMM intervention. Uh, next slide, please. To date, um, I've made a total of uh, 259 calls. And so this includes follow-up calls with the members that I've already spoken to initially. Um, and out of those, 17 members are in the acute phase and four members in the continuation phase. And now the member pool for the acute phase has been approximately about 50 each week. Um, the, the list is sort of uh, alive and breathing, you know. Um, there are some members that will drop off because they, uh, they, they're kind of excluded from the measure because they run out of uh, of uh, the day, the they run out of days uh, that they can be in the measure. Um, that they haven't refilled their prescription for three months or two months, you know, whatever the days are. And so they'll just drop off the list, and then new members will also um, uh, get into the list each week. Uh, and for the continuation phase, uh, that's a much smaller list usually uh, 15 members or so, um, with about five members identified weekly, um, new ones that come on the list. And so with uh, challenges, it is very uh, difficult sometimes, you know, because uh, there's incorrect or disconnected phone numbers. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the, the phone numbers that are on file that we have actually belong to the rehab facility. Uh, where they were at. They may still be there, they may not. Uh, when I call a facility, sometimes they say, you know, we're not allowed to disclose if the member is here, but uh, we'll definitely, I guess, have the member reach out back to you if they are here. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, also, I'm dealing with members who may be homeless, um, and again, who may be at a rehab facility and not have a direct phone number that I can reach out to them. Um, there, uh, there's also a challenge with the lack of care coordination where um, members have uh, been to the hospital already, either for drug overuse or mental health issues. And then they leave the hospital without making a follow-up appointment with their PCP or mental health provider. And so uh, they leave the hospital with the medications that they, that they were prescribed there, but no refills. And so there's not a way for them to get more medication after they leave the hospital because they haven't followed up. And also, some members have an extensive history of missed appointments and so uh, and may be in need of finding a new provider because of that. And so a lot of times, I'm kind of coaching the member as to, like, it is really important. Please follow up with your PCP. Uh, do you need a list of providers in your area? Because if so, I can transfer you to a member uh, care representative here with the Utah Medicaid, and they can set you up with a list so you can find a new provider as soon as possible. And just stress the importance of really taking their medications every day um, to, to, to limit the, uh, the risk of uh, relapse, depression, uh, and other comorbidities. So that is kind of what I have for you. Any questions or feedback that you might have? Thank you, Luis. Do we have any opinion idea from the board regarding the AMM process? No, I'll just say I'm struck with, um, again, how much, um, you know, time and effort um, 
is uh, is required to address the many social determinants of health, and and it just uh, you've you've uh, presented so much of that with this with this project. So thank you. I would echo that. It it great work. Thank you. I guess one more thing, if it, if it comes to uh, any questions that relate to um, the, the intersections of pain um, in this population, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to consult at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that. And I do want to uh, mention something Luis <clears throat> didn't bring up, which is finding the correct phone number. Um, and sometimes, you know, he's uh, and others of, on the team are calling far like pharmacies seem to be the best source for a different phone number. Um, but, you know, calling the pharmacies, um, calling the PCP or the prescriber of their medicine, um, it, it's very, very time consuming uh, work. And then also, as we know, sometimes if you're if you're on a phone that you purchase minutes, you simply just run out of minutes and your phone won't turn on until um, the next cycle goes around or you know you have the opportunity members the opportunity to pay the bill so this is also a problem and a challenge um, and anyway we're going to keep tracking this intervention over time uh, we do also have the barrier of you know fee for service doesn't have extensive resources to offer the member when you know we have identified social determinants right like housing issues food security issues um, but Luis is really aimed at using clear language and speaking in um, ways that engage the member and try to identify at least the educational barriers and the needs that the individual has from, from at least the healthcare delivery setting. And I think he does a really great job just taking his time, you know, meeting them where they're at, asking questions, helping to partner with them um, through this. And I think he's, he's done a really good job with this. So. Um, thanks for your time in um, hearing the update on this, and we'll provide further updates um, as as we move forward in time. Um, the next thing um, I just want to, I had one slide on uh, an update we wanted to give you on vaccinations. So uh, another strategic goal of our team this year um, is to increase pediatric access to vaccine for children uh, program covered vaccines, okay? So um, this was identified as an issue prior to COVID, actually, where um, we as a pharmacy team meet regularly, I, said, I guess myself and, and Andrea meet um, quarterly with the VFC program and talk to them um, about, you know, what are they covering this year and, and, um, and every other operational aspect is how it intersects with pharmacy. Um, the VFC program, the Vaccine Children Program as a background, is a federally funded program. And this program offers vaccine to um, recipients in the state of Utah who are uninsured or underinsured. Medicaid qualifies for this and partners with this. So when we have a, and this is in our manual as well as on our website, and the VFC program um, has pharmacies, mostly enrolled providers that are providers. Are any of you VFC providers or familiar with this? You could speak about it from the provider side. Um, but what, what it has is that the VFC program has an agreement. So they will have an agreement. And that's a, one of the um, public health programs in the Department of Health is the Vaccines for Children program. And they will work with community uh, partners, whether that be our public health centers, our uh, providers, offices, and even pharmacies to have an arrangement where they will, um, I, I don't want to get into all the nuts and bolts because I might be wrong, but from what I understand is you enroll as a VFC provider. If I'm a pharmacy enrolling as a VFC provider, um, there are certain, you know, paperwork and federal as well as local um, agreements that are put in place. There's also uh, my VFC stock is kept separate. I put an order in to say which uh, VFC vaccine for children uh, vaccines do I want to cover. Many of our providers in the pharmacy side will cover just flu shot, for example, but still 
an excellent access point for pediatric patients to go to their pharmacy and get their flu shot. Um, but they'll, they can do any number of things. Um, and when you do this, uh, what this also signs the pharmacy or the provider up for is partnership with the VFC program. So the VFC um, uh, program manager will meet with the provider and they will do a site visit. They will evaluate how the stock is stored, how the inventory is managed, um, and other things like that. So what we found, and first of all, the way that Medicaid uh, manages this is that the VFC stock um, and the VFC vaccines bill through our system uh, for free, but there is an administration fee that is given for um, giving the vaccine. And at one of the challenges we saw um, prior to this initiative being put in place is that while we had providers and community stakeholders who were enrolled in this, we had very little to almost like only a handful of pharmacies across the state. Now this is of course pre-COVID and then COVID hits. And, and also at the time, we know that our pediatric vaccination rates have gone down. Um, and I don't have those exact numbers, but this is again, another topic we discussed at our managed care meeting yesterday and talked about initiatives and uh, programs that are being put in place to try to really promote education, access, and um, you know, uh, opportunities to promote our vaccination among um, children specifically, but also adults as well. So one of our goals in the pharmacy program this year, um, especially as COVID and patients were becoming more routine, uh, adult patients moving to the pharmacy to get a vaccine, was also really kind of working at this time with the VFC program to get more pharmacies enrolled to actually administer childhood vaccines at the pharmacy level. Um, we saw this as a barrier last year. We had numerous phone calls saying, hey, children can't get into the pharmacy, but I also can't get into my pediatrician's office, right? So we've been working with the VFC program to really get and boost enrollment. The second piece too, is that our pharmacy programming historically did not actually allow a VFC uh, vaccine to process through the point of sale and give a um, administration fee correctly. Um, and so we fixed that programming so that it can operate um, correctly and that's going into effect in another week or two, I believe. Um, and what one of the, again, this is just kind of a high level to let you know about something we're working on, but one of the great steps forward already that we've had, Eric, if I can do a quick shout out for Inner Mountain, um, I've been working with, uh, we've talked with Jeff Olson and, you know, the Inner Mountain has partnered with the VFC program for its 23 community pharmacies to become a VFC provider. And they're going live um, this year for a flu campaign. So with the flu shot this year and then moving on to other vaccines next year is, is the plan according to what Jeff has shared with us. So we're really excited to have Inner Mountain on board with that. And we would encourage others if you have the opportunity to influence um, a system and or even individual pharmacies that um, have uh, good vaccine administration programs in place um, to become partners with the VFC program and provide the opportunity for Medicaid children um, to get their flu shot or other childhood vaccines in community pharmacies, as well as through their pediatri pediatric offices or, or wherever it is that they go in. Uh, but more specifically, we saw this as an opportunity as it, as it definitely has been identified as a barrier for not having these pharmacies enrolled. So um, just a quick update. We'll take any comments or feedback you may have um, at this time, but this is more an FYI to let you know about something we're working on. Um, I just had a comment. I know um, at, on the pediatric side, we talked with the pharmacists about a little bit about this with some legislation that was going on last legislative session. Um, just a, a few concerns we had as pediatricians was um, one of the reasons that um, it's helpful for kids to come to a pediatric practice to get their well checks is to their uh, your shots is to do well checks as well and catch things like you know amblyopia early or hip dysplasia early things that, that if you catch early you can prevent problems as well as checking on the family's you know psychosocial status and that. But we certainly don't want there to be added barriers to immunizations. I know talking to the pharmacists at the on the pharmacy. Um, uh, chapter, you know, for, for the state, they were like, well, we're not <laughs> trying to infringe on anyone's, you know, space either, which just, I love the idea of having more access, but still trying to make sure kids do get that follow-up with their primary care providers. And then, of course, 
you know, obviously access to USIS um, will be important for any pharmacy doing um, non-flu shots because certain shots have certain windows of time they have to be given after other shots, just making sure that we really are not, you know, we don't want to give a shot that didn't count because it was a week early, that kind of thing. And, and so, you know, and I know that will be part of the education with VFC. And we sure appreciate the VFC program. I know at our care facility and, and love what we're doing. Just, I guess, just keep in mind, we still want to have these families eventually get into their own doctors. But I, certainly I love the idea of decreasing barriers to immunization. Hey, and Jennifer, I mean, just for, for the record, I mean, pharmacists before they administer a vaccine are actually required to check uses. That's actually in state code. Uh, that doesn't exist for physicians in emergency rooms and everything else. So uh, the pharmacists are doing a really good job with this. Put a plug in for my own profession, so. Thank you both for your comments. And um, I, th I think they're both great comments. And Eric, I'm just excited to have Intermountain on board with, with uh, having an access point for the for the kiddos for at least flu shots. We, we did have numerous calls last year on this. So it'll be exciting, so. All right, that's it, that's it for me. Um, I think you can go ahead and transition over to our next item. Thank you, Jen. The next item will be the presentation on Capanova. And then we have a public comment from Utah AIDS Foundations and the prior authorization for Capanova, but seeing the time right now is the limited. Um, we can consider the PA for the next meeting if we run out of time, but I will try to do the short presentation in the public comment. Do you see the screen just fine? Make it bigger. So this is about Cabanova. Cabanova is including the Capoteravir and Propivirin extended release injectable suspension. The indication of Cabanova is, this is approved in January of 2021. This is approved for a complete regimen for the treatment of HIV-1 infection in adult to replace the current antiretroviral regimen in those who are virologically suppressed, which is decided by HIV-1 RNA less than 50 copy per ml, who is on a stable antiretroviral regimen with no history of treatment failure and no known or suspected resistance to either capotegravir or propirivirin. The mechanism of this medication, this is not any novel new mechanism of action. This is the combination of two existing MOA Capotegravir is an integrase inhibitor. Integrase inhibitor disrupted the HIV-1 replication. The prepivirin is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It's a non-competitor antagonist to also disrupting the HIV-1 replication. Per dosing and administration, prior to initiating the uh, Capanova, the patient need to take the capotegravir 30 milligram tablet together with propivirin 25 milligram tablet once daily for 28 days to assess the tolerance of both medication. On the last day of oral lead-in, initiate the injection of Cabinuva initial dose, which is 600 milligram of capotegravir and 900 milligram of propivirin for the second month. After the second month, Continue the injection with Cabinuva, maintain dose, which is 400 milligram of Cabotegravir and 600 milligram of Propivirin every month thereafter. It's worth to know that a complete dose of Cabinuva requiring two separate injections. One injection of Cabotegravir intramuscular into one gluteal side and another injection of Propivirin intramuscular into a separate gluteal side during the same visit. The administration order of capotegravir and propivirin injection is not important. The longer needle may be required for the patient with the higher BMI. They, the package insert or prescribing information included a very detailed missed injection. Um, for the patient who plan to miss the injection more than seven days, is it recommended for the patient to breaching those gap with one 30 milligram tablet of capotegravir 
together with one 25 milligram tablet of piperivine daily up to two consecutive months. There is no direction on if the patient is missed more than two months when they are breaching. Um, for the unplanned missed injection of more than seven days, it's recommended for the provider to clinically reassess the patient to determine if the resumption of injection dosing remain appropriate for this patient. The table two is having the dose recommendation. If the patient missed the injection dose less than or equal than two months, they can resume with the maintenance cabinuva dosing. But if they happen to miss the injection more than two months, it is better to reinitiate a patient with the initial cabinuva dose which is a 600 and 900 milligram, and then continue with the main and dose of 400 and 600 milligram thereafter. There is some of the adverse event warning, precaution, and adverse reaction of Cabanova. There is a report on the hypersensitivity and post-injection reaction after Cabanova. So it's recommended to monitoring the patient for 10 minutes after the injection. Hepatotoxicity can also happen. Recommended to monitor of liver chemistry and discontinue cabinuva if hepatotoxicity is suspected. Patient in the clinical trial also report depressive, uh, depressive disorder. The package insert recommend the provider to monitor for patient symptom and assess whether the symptom are related to cabinuva and to determine whether the risk of continuing therapy would outweigh the benefit. Cabinuva is a long-acting, so there is a long-acting property and potential associated risk with Cabinuva. It's recommended to carefully select the patient that agree to adhere to monthly injection because if the non-adherence happen, it could lead to a loss of virologic response and resistance of the virus. If the virologic failure is suspected, recommended to switch to an alternative antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible. There are some site, some drug interaction with the cabinuva. Cabinuva is a complete regimen. Therefore, co-administration of cabinuva with other antiretroviral therapy is not generally recommended. Cabinuva can stay in the system up to 12 months or longer, but however, it's not expected to affect any other antiretroviral to be continued after stopping the cabinuva. The capotegravy is metabolizing by the UGT1A1 or 1A9 enzyme, and the gripiravir is metabolizing by the CYP3A. Therefore, if it's taken with any of those inducer for the enzyme, they are put, we are putting the cabinuva at risk for loss of virologic effect. So it's not recommended to be using together with those inducers for these and them. The safety and efficacy of Cabanova is established based on two randomized multi-center active control parallel arm open label and non-inferior trial. The first trial is the FLARE trial. It included 629 participants. The inclusion are the HIV-1 infected, antiretroviral treatment naive subject who is receiving a docloteravir containing regimen for 20 weeks, either the docloteravir integrated inhibitor or abacavir, um, which is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase, and the lamivudine. Or the participant can also receive docloteravir plus two order nucleoside reverse transcriptase. The subjects who are virologically suppressed, defining by HIV-1 less than 50 copy per ml, were then randomized to receive either a capotegravir plus prepivirin regimen or remain on the current antiretroviral regimen. The subject randomized to receive capotegravir plus prepivirin initiate treatment with daily oral lead-in therapy at notice earlier for at least two weeks following by the monthly injection with Cabanova for additional 44 weeks. The second study is the ALA study with 616 subjects. It's also including adult patients with HIV-1 who were virologically suppressed for at least six months onto an RTI and a third agent. 
Subject will also randomize to receive Capotec Revere plus Prepivirin initiate treatment with also oral lead in therapy and follow it for the additional 44 weeks. The two study exclude patients with hepatitis B, patients with moderate or severe hepatic impairment, and pregnant women. The baseline is similar across both study in both treatment arms. The primary endpoint of Flay and Alice was the proportion of subject with plasma HIV-1 RNA greater than or equal to 50 copy at week 48. And this is a non-inferior study. For the result, it is concluded that the Cabanova were found to be non-inferior to daily oral competitor, which is in the FLARE study, is include the uh, Doclotaravir, Apecavir, and Lamivudin. And in Alice study, it was the current anti-retrol regimen that they are patient currently on. For the primary endpoint, across both study, 2% in um, capotecravir and propivirin, and the current antiretroviral regimen, the same with ALICE. Uh, there is no difference in the treatment between both arm in both study. The discontinuation rate also similar across the study arm for 3%, 1%, 4%, and 2%. The place in therapy, per the guidelines for the use of antiretroviral agents in adult and adolescent living with HIV, which is updated on June 3rd of 2021, is stated that a long-acting antiretroviral regimen, such as the combination of injectable capotecravir and propivirin, is an optimization option for patients who are engaged with their healthcare virologically suppressed on oral therapy for three to six months. The clinical study was doing for six months for patients who are on stabling on current regimen and who agreed to make the frequent clinic visit need to receive an injectable drugs. The, evident, uh, the recommendation is rated as A1, strong recommendation. It's also stated that to switch to a long-acting injectable regimen to relieve the bio fatigue or to decrease potential stigma or disclose concern associated with taking daily oral medication. Looking at other state coverage, Utah had put Cabanova to the PDL starting March 2021. However, we have zero utilization. Florida has uh, Cabanova with prior authorization with the criteria to the prescribing information, including patient must be more older than 18 years of age must have a confirmed diagnosis of HIV-1, was rapidly treated on a stable anti-retro uh, regimen for a minimum of six months, and requiring initiating with oral lead-in therapy. Washington State also have Cabanova with as a refer, but with the prior authorization as well. Similar criteria to package insert as Florida, and also including the patient have documentation of one of the following neurodiversity of or a behavioral health condition but impairs the patient's ability to manage multiple medication, or patient have severe substance use disorder, or the patient have diagnosis swallowing disorder, or co uh, cognitive impairment requiring assistance with activity or daily living. Our recommendation for the board is to have Cabanova as a referred product on the PDL and requiring the PI authorization to obtain Cabanova. That is the end of my presentation. And I welcome question and feedback. Um, Dr. Winston, neurodiversity, that's a good question. That was actually listed on the Washington uh, PI authorization right. for that. I, I like to learn things, especially when it comes to neurology. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. I had a question for you, though. So, um, is is this? Um, I was just curious about where we think the setting for this um, injectable therapy is uh, is likely to be here in Utah. Do, are folks, um, Dr. Siegfried, others, um, 
or with those working with adolescents, you know, where, where are we likely to see this um, injectable therapy? Just, just for my understanding. I'm sorry, I, uh, do you want to know the setting yeah. up? The Are you saying the setting of administration or where you think there will be use? So like it will be residentials I think. or homeless, pay, I mean, you know, yeah. free, free clinics. I mean, where are we, where are we? I'm, so just, I'm, just, it's just, I'm just curious. We could invite public comment if there is someone um, here that could provide a, a public perspective. Um, I can just say I, I did meet with the Ryan White group last week and reviewed a, a proposed prior authorization language with them. And for for, for that group who, of course, um, you know, they don't really see this drug as being the uh, blockbuster that they see new drugs. There are, are six month therapies that are injectables that are six months long in the pipeline from two different organizations. So uh, I should say manufacturers. Um, and so I, I don't want to, you know, it's just in their mind, they say this, this drug because of the, you know, potential compliance issues that if you're, if there's a gap in getting an injection, you know, you may have to restart oral therapy and the need to go to the office monthly, um, as we've talked about it as a group of pharmacists, I mean, it's two injections, right? And you got to get one in each cheek, right? So it's, it's definitely for a one month drug. Um, if I could just refer to my conversation with with the folks at the Ryan White Foundation, they don't see this drug as being uh, as wowza uh, as they do future drugs that are in the pipeline that will offer six months of coverage and really truly address pill burden and um, compliance issues that some individuals have. As far as setting, uh, we have not had any claims for this product. It was approved, I believe, in March. Um, we haven't had any claims, and I believe Ryan White said they had one one patient who was on it so far. So. Um, anyway, it's not directly answering your question, but based off of folks who uh, have more direct experience with this product, that that's the feedback I got from from them. Thank you, Jen. And we do have one public comment from the Utah AIDS Foundation. Um, can I have Mr. Haffen, please? Jared Haffen. It looked like he's, he he's no longer on the list of attendees noon. Yeah. Yes. I just noticed that too. Um, we can move on to the prior authorization or we can post it to the next meeting. See, we only like eight minutes left. Let's go through it noon. Let's try to get present it. Um, this, just as a quick background, this prior authorization is pretty close to label. It was reviewed by, again, I met with Ryan White just to give their thoughts on it. and. Um, they reviewed it and felt comfortable with with the document as it's put together. But and again, I think the important piece is our recommendation that it's preferred status, but with a clinical PA due to some of the considerations of the drug. So it will have preferred status on the PDL. So the prior authorization, as Jen say, is very closely to the prescribing information. For patient who is 18 years of age or older, patient who have diagnosis of human immunodeficiency virus type 1, the medication required to be prescribed by or in consultation with an infectious disease specialist. The attestation that patient has been virologically subspread, defined by HIV-1 RNA, less than 50 copy per ml, on a stable antiretroviral therapy for at least three months, based on the recommendation from the guideline, was submitted laboratory level. An attestation that patient is not receiving cabinuva concomitantly with another ART medication. Patient is not receiving concurrent UGT1A1 and or C3A4 enzyme inducer induction medication, which may significantly decrease capotecravir and or preparing concentration 
and result in loss of biologically respond. Uh, these drugs included, but are not limited to anticonvulsion, uh, camapazabine, oxacapazabine, phenobarbital, phenytoin, or rifabutin, rifambin, rifabutin, dexamethasone, and Sanchot word. Patient will receive an oral lead-in dosing with vocabria, which is the capotegravir and adurin, which is prepivirin, 25 milligram, one month before starting Capanuva. Patient have no history of treatment failure. Patient does not have a suspected resistance to either capotegravir or prepivirin. The prescriber will manage planned and unplanned misdo as per the prescribing information. Initial art is decided for six months and re art can be up to one year after. We have a note part in here that in the approval of the Cabinuva, the oral version of Vocaria and Edurin will also be approved for one month before the patient starting Cabinuva. We welcome feedback from the board. So, sorry, the the um, the concurrent um, anticonvulsants and antimycobacterials. That's a um, that's a uh, absolute contraindication. Unfortunately, that is based on the prescribing information. It is a contraindication to Cabinuva. Right. Okay. That that's probably going to limit a fair amount of therapy. Can you just scroll it up so we see what's on the bottom there? Yeah. Was there more? Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we can take a motion to approve if there aren't any comments or concerns. Motion to approve as written. Can I have a second? I'll second up. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstention? Thank you. Motion to pass the PA as written. And that is the end of our meeting today. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you. Well, good to see all of you. Take care. Thanks. Have guys. a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.